urban legend is a story that is passed down over the years that is usually based on myths and no real evidence. But some urban legends are loosely based on real life events. And sometimes, years after the legend has started, an event will take place that mimics it, turning it from an urban legend into a real life event. Now, these are mainly creepy true urban legends, but I do want to do a few different videos to do with mythical, paranormal, and alien urban legends, so keep an eye out for those videos. But anyway, let's get started with this one. Kidney Theft You may have heard the urban legend of the businessman on a trip who meets a woman in a bar, and after spending the evening together drinking, she invites him back to her hotel room. Then, the next thing the man remembers is waking up the next day, he is suffering with severe back pain and is taken to the emergency room, where doctors discovered he has undergone a major operation just a few hours earlier. And unbeknown to the man, it's confirmed that one of his kidneys has been cleanly and professionally removed. It does sound like nothing more than a legend, but this has happened many times. One of the most documented cases being Nassim Mohammed, a 25-year-old labourer from Ahmedabad in India. Nassim was waiting with some other men at a labour market when he was approached by a man who offered him a three-month painting contract. Desperate for work, Nassim accepted and was put up in a house where he was kept for two weeks. His recruiters told him they were waiting for a tender to pass before the work could begin, but Nassim was well fed and looked after while staying at the house and had no reason to suspect anything, until one day he was persuaded into giving a blood sample and shortly after an injection. The next thing he knows, he's waking up in a hospital bed. Nassim said he felt an acute pain on the left side of his body, and as he fell beneath the medical gown he had been dressed in, he could feel a bandage and surgical tape. To his horror, he realized he had been operated on, and an armed guard who stood by the doorway confirmed that one of Nassim's kidneys had been illegally removed. Nassim was thought to be one of the last of over 500 vulnerable Indian men who were preyed upon by kidney thieves in that particular area. The victims were lured with promise of work only to find out that they were part of an illegal transplant operation run by a team of doctors, the main man being Dr. Amit Kumar, who were being paid to supply human kidneys to the rich, wealthy Indians and foreigners. Nassim tells of the countless other Indian men who had their kidneys stolen without their knowledge until they woke up to the realization that they were missing an organ, meaning this urban legend is in fact true. The Killer in the Backseat the legend is that a woman is driving home alone late at night when she notices bright lights in a rearview mirror. As the vehicle gets closer, it continually flashes its lights whilst tailgating her, even ramming the back of her car. When the woman arrives home, she realizes that the driver was trying to warn her that he could see a man in the back of her car who was about to attack her who is an escaped murderer. In other versions of the tale, the woman stops for fuel and the attendant asks her to get out of her car and come to the office as there is a problem with her payment. Once in the office, the attendant asks if she's aware that there is a man sat in the back of her car with a machete. This old legend has been used in many horror films, such as the original Halloween film, but it's thought that this urban legend is based on a story that took place in New York in 1964, when an unsuspecting police officer found an escaped murderer hiding in the back of his patrol car. After recognizing the dangerous killer, he shot him dead, and it's thought that the criminal was planning to kill the officer once he'd returned to the car. Despite the obvious differences in this story and the legend, it's widely believed that the killer in the back seat did originate from this incident. But another terrible real event took place in Chicago in 2013, when a man snuck into the back of a woman's minivan while she was inside a gas station paying. When she returned to the car and drove off, the attacker showed himself and assaulted her, and then told her to drive to a cash machine to withdraw cash. But there is a serious message that can be taken from this urban legend and the stories. Always lock your car doors, especially when you leave the car only briefly, because you never know who could climb in the back. The body under the bed. Now, this next legend is a pretty disgusting one, but it has been around for many years. It tells the story of a honeymoon couple who check into their Las Vegas hotel and are delighted with their room. But as they settle in, they are aware of a bad odor. So bad that they ring down to reception to see if there is another room available. Unfortunately, the hotel is fully booked, but they offer to send a maid up to thoroughly clean the place to try and get rid of the smell. But when the couple return from their night out, they can still smell the odor. At this point, the pair were annoyed and started to tear the entire room apart in a bid to find the smell. And as they pulled the mattress off the box spring, they were horrified to find the corpse of a woman. That is the urban legend, and unfortunately, this has happened long after the legend's origin. In 2010, police were searching for 28-year-old mother of five, Sony Milbrook, when they made a shocking discovery. Her body was found in a metal box frame beneath the mattress in room 222 of the Budget Inn Motel in Memphis. Milbrook had been missing for two months, and forensics confirmed her body had been under the bed all that time. It was also reported that the room was rented out around five times in the two months since the body was hiding, so people had slept on the bed. It was confirmed that she'd been murdered and had stayed at the motel prior to her death. But when payment wasn't made, her belongings were removed from the room and it was cleaned and rented out again. Milbrook's family repeatedly asked the motel staff if they could search the room when she first disappeared, but staff refused. Shortly after her discovery, Milbrook's boyfriend was arrested and convicted of her murder and sentenced to life in prison. It's crazy that if staff would have searched the motel room, her body would have been found and no one would have slept just inches above her in that bed. And the body under the bed would have remained just an urban legend. Killer is inside the house. This is one of the most popular legends out there. A teenage babysitter has put all the children to bed and is downstairs watching TV. The phone rings and the girl answers it. 
On the other end is a man laughing who tells her to check on the children. When she asks who is calling, he hangs up. Thinking the call is a hoax, the girl ignores it and carries on watching TV. The phone rings again with the same man, and now the girl is getting worried and decides to call the police. They tell her to wait at the house and they will trace the next call she gets. When the man rings again, the police call the girl and tell her the caller is inside the house and she should get out as soon as she can. The girl is greeted outside by the police and they tell her the caller is upstairs with the children. It's a creepy legend and has been used for many movies, but tragically there is a true story behind it and it involves 13-year-old Janet Christman. On the evening of March the 18th, 1950, Janet was babysitting a three-year-old boy at his home in Columbia, Missouri. It was a stormy night and Janet had turned down a party invitation to earn a few extra dollars babysitting. At around 10.30pm, police officers received a call from a young girl who was screaming hysterically, asking for someone to help her. But before the policeman could identify the caller, the line went dead. The phone call could not be traced as no one was manning the telephone test board. When the child's parents returned from their night out at around 1.30am, they found the house ransacked and made the most horrific discovery. Janet's body was lying in a pool of blood with evidence of her frantically running through the house. It's thought the intruder smashed a window and attacked Janet in the living room, hitting her over the head, possibly strangling her with the cord of an iron and attacking her with a mechanical pencil. The initial suspect for the murder was a local man who was known to carry a mechanical pencil and had shown an interest in Janet. But inexplicably, there was little cooperation from the police and the sheriff's department involved in the case. So despite evidence linking the man to the crime, he was never convicted and Janet's murder remains unsolved, sadly giving some truth to the babysitter urban legend. Polybius the Cursed Game Now this is a strange one. It could be true, but it could also just be purely an urban legend. So instead of comparing the legend with the truth, I'll just look into the story behind the so-called cursed game and you can let me know what you think. In 1981, an arcade cabinet game called Polybius briefly appeared in a Portland, Oregon amusement park. The style of the game itself cannot be confirmed as some describe it as a weird abstract action format with a series of puzzles and others describe it as an action space fighter. But according to the legend, it was so popular that it was causing addiction and lines of people would form around the game often resulting in fights over who would play next. But Polybius was no ordinary game. It was said to induce various psychological effects on players, with reports of people suffering from a series of unpleasant side effects, ranging from amnesia, nightmares, stress, and even a fear of playing any type of game, with some players apparently turning into anti-gaming activists. Then, around a month after the game's release, it disappeared, and Polybius has vanished without a trace. The rumors over the years are that it was a prototype for the arcade game Tempest, but this has always been denied, and the most believed thought is that it was a tool of the United States government to test the player's mental and physical ability as a method of recruiting soldiers, According to the legend, there were also reports that the machines were visited by men in black suits who would collect unknown data from them, allegedly to test responses to the game's psychoactive effects. The urban legend and stories about Polybius have appeared as a feature story in the 2003 September edition of Game Pro magazine, under the heading Secrets and Lies. It has also appeared in an episode of The Simpsons, with the words Property of the US Government printed on the front of the machine, and it still continues to be the subject of numerous investigation-type programs. In 2011, a Polybius machine was rumored to have been located in a Newport, Oregon storage unit. It was recognized by the name on the side, and it looks like an old Pac-Man game. The owner was apparently intending to sell it on eBay, but no more information has been released. So if anyone can shed some light on this mysterious cursed game, or if anyone has even played it, then let everyone know. The people who apparently did play it said it was very real, and something was eerie and off about it. So maybe Polybius was a real cursed game, or maybe it's nothing more than an urban legend trying to stop people from playing too many video games.
You probably know that Australia was settled by British convicts, but chances are you have no idea just how wild those convict ships could get, especially the first ship full of female prisoners. This motley crew of British women sent over by Great Britain in hopes to reform the struggling convict colony of New South Wales was made up of primarily petty thieves and sex workers, and the complexity, tragedy, and triumph of their story will completely blow your mind. Today we're exploring the terrifying and wild world of the Lady Juliana, a special 18th century convict ship full of female prisoners sent to Australia. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. Oh, and that's just not enough. Leave us a comment and let us know what topics you would like to hear about. Ahoy, mate. It's time to hop aboard the Lady Juliana, the wild 18th century prison ship filled with women. Considering it was the 18th century and you couldn't exactly hop on a jet, the voyage from England to Australia lasted about 10 brutally long months. As the ship voyaged from port to port in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, the ladies stopped in places like Rio de Janeiro and Cape Town along the way. And these weren't short little stops to buy souvenirs and stretch their legs. Sometimes they'd be docked for several weeks at a time. Often the convicts made the most of their global tour and did one of the few jobs available to women at the time. As John Nicole, the ship's steward, euphemistically remembered, we did not restrain the people on shore from coming on board through the day. The captains and seamen who were in port at the time, paid us many visits. The ladies kept at least part of their earnings. Some of the ship's officers and sailors, all men of course, allegedly even got in on the business. Sadly, their involvement raises serious questions about the degree to which these captive women were coerced into their activities. Lust, coercion, boredom, or necessity, many of the women on board the ship became the wives of the ship's officers and crew members. As the ship's steward John Nickel recalled in his memoir of the voyage, when we were fairly out at sea, every man on board took a wife from among the convicts. They nothing loathe. While these marriages were definitely not legal, they did sometimes serve a practical purpose for the convicted women. Taking a lover on board the ship often meant you got to sleep in a better bed. There was, however, at least one partnership rooted in true love. Nickel, the ship's steward we just told you about, seemed to have fallen in love with prisoner Sarah Whitlam. He even intended to marry her once her term ended, but sadly, the two never made it down the aisle. Nickel had to go back to Britain, leaving Whitlam and their child behind in Australia. He attempted to find her and reunite, but tragically, they never saw each other again. It's kind of like the plot of Titanic, with a pregnancy and convicted lady felon thrown in the mix. And if you're taken by Nickel and Whitlam's love story, I do have to warn you that most of the partnerships aboard were not exactly as star-crossed as theirs. The lack of privacy for prisoners on convict ships meant that crew members had access to them, and their relations and interactions could be non-consensual. Considering the age of consent in 18th century Britain was devastatingly low, 10 years old to be exact, some crew members had no problem taking teenage wives during the voyage. Historian Pamela Horn identified 14-year-old Jane Forbes as one such young wife. She had a baby before reaching Australia. Women of the Lady Juliana had a particular purpose. Colonial officials hoped that a shipload of women would help civilize the budding convict colony. Considering most of the women aboard were petty thieves, maybe they were hoping these women would steal some hearts. According to one British official, the increased presence of women would promote a matrimonial connection to improve morals and secure settlement. The women were meant to marry male colonists, which would supposedly create and maintain respectable family life in the new colony. The women's prison sentences aimed to transform them into moral vessels that would enable the recreation of the British family unit abroad. being transported to New South Wales on the Lady Juliana were prisoners, but their lives were upended for infractions that honestly don't seem like that big of a deal from our 21st century gaze. Though some of the women aboard the Lady Juliana might have been sex workers, that's not why they were sent to Australia. Sex work, or harlotry, was not a transportable offense. In fact, most of the women on the ship had been arrested and sentenced for various degrees of theft. Their offenses ranged from highway robbery to shoplifting and pickpocketing. Mary Hook, for example, was around 20 years old when the British court commuted her punishment for stealing her employer's money and goods from capital punishment to a seven-year sentence in New South Wales. So basically, she was almost killed just because she stole a few things from work, but instead the British government mercifully sent her to an entirely different continent. One of the most notable convicts on the ship was Elizabeth Barnsley. She was convicted for the dangerous and heinous crime of, uh, stealing some cloth. Anyway, Liz, the fabric thief, quickly became a leader during the voyage. John Nicol wrote about her saying, She was very kind to her fellow convicts, who were poor. They were all anxious to serve her. She was as queen among them. Barnsley, who ended up fashioning a career as a madam while on board the ship, was instrumental in overseeing her fellow convicts' economic activities at every port along the way. Though they were not being transported to New South Wales for prostitution, many of the women aboard the Lady Juliana may have been sex workers in addition to whatever petty crimes they committed. A robust harlotry economy existed in 18th century Britain, so it's reasonable to assume that at least some of the 200-plus convicts took part in that line of work. The women aboard the Lady Juliana came from British prisons. Though a prison reform movement began to grow in the late 18th century, the prison conditions they escaped were deplorable. 
prisons were overcrowded and disease spread swiftly. Just existing in a prison could accidentally lead to a death sentence. And yes, it was still a prison ship. And yes, most of the passenger convicts slept just above the ship's garbage and sewage deck. But the women of the Lady Juliana had something that their land and prison counterparts didn't. Consistent access to medical care. The ship had a surgeon and was kept relatively clean. Also, the women weren't chained up like prisoners on other convict ships, and they could barter for improved conditions through various favors. Part of the reason the passengers on the Lady Juliana enjoyed better conditions was because the British government oversaw it, unlike the other ships in the Second Fleet. All the other vessels were operated by Camden, Calvert, and King, a notorious and prolific slave trading company. Only five women perished aboard the Lady Juliana compared to the 267 deaths reported by the other ships. So while it wasn't a carnival cruise, at least most of the women didn't straight up die. The vast majority of the women who embarked on the Lady Juliana were in their 20s and 30s, but no fewer than 51 of them, around 22%, were teenagers. Mary Wade was one such teen who could have been as young as 11 while aboard. Scholars debate about her exact age, though. Mary was the youngest on the ship. Like many of her shipmates, Wade ultimately married and had a large number of children in Australia. While there wasn't too much trouble making aboard the Lady Juliana during its 11-month voyage, one notable issue did arise involving drunkenness leading to disorderly behavior. But come on, if you were on a ship full of cool criminal chicks, wouldn't you want to throw back a few tequila shots with your girls? To curb her so-called Rowdiness. Crew members made passenger Nance Farrell wear a repurposed wooden barrel jacket to keep her from being too much of a drunk mess. When that didn't work, they resorted to flogging her 12 times. Yikes. Some of the women aboard the Lady Juliana were already mothers before the ship departed England, and so they brought their children with them. Many of the convict passengers became pregnant and even gave birth during the long voyage. Historians generally believe five to seven babies were born on the ship, but steward John Nichols suggested no less than 20 had been born while the ship was in port at Rio. They were prepared for the births. The ship had received a small donation of baby linens before leaving England. This brings a whole new meaning to the concept of water births. Once the women of the Lady Juliana arrived in their new homeland of New South Wales, they quickly discovered they could enjoy freedoms there that they couldn't in England, even though they were prisoners with few rights who were put in difficult and often dangerous positions. Women arriving in Australia were free from certain British moral codes, even while colonial officials expected them to be vessels of morality. English laws that marked children of unwed mothers as illegitimate, for example, were not enforced. Though being transported to a new colony to get married and propagate British family life was no doubt a complete and total drag, many women made the most of their circumstances in Australia. Some Lady Juliana passengers became upwardly mobile once their prison terms ended and even started their own businesses. Anne Marsh, for one, found success after being abandoned by her ship husband. She got started and ran a variety of businesses, including a liquor shop and a ferry company. You go, girl. While they may have had a rough and terrifying experience, it's no doubt the ship full of women made a lasting impact on Australia and changed the course of history forever. The women of the Lady Juliana became known as the founding mothers of Australia. Between their side hustles in Ports of Call and their romantic bartering aboard the ship, their journey has gone down in history books as one of the most legendary. What do you think of the women of...
friends of the old game, but chances are you have no idea what everyday life was really like on the Oregon Trail. Packing up your entire life to face a 2,000 mile stretch of death, disease, and danger, life on the Oregon Trail was actually a lot more exciting and at the same time a lot more boring than you'd probably ever think. Today we're exploring what life was really like on the Oregon Trail. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. Oh, and that's just not enough. Leave a comment and let us know what history you would like to experience. Okay, let's get on this wagon. The Oregon Trail was 2,170 miles of danger and boredom that stretched from Missouri to Oregon. To say daily life on the Oregon Trail was difficult is a vast understatement. It was hard work and required uprooting your entire family and deciding to venture west for new opportunities. But that didn't stop thousands of people from hopping onto their wagons and emigrating into the vast unknown. Maybe it was a chance to start over. Maybe it was the thrill of adventure. Maybe it was moving away from their annoying neighbor. Hello, Newman. Or maybe it was the promise of a parcel of land double the size of Disneyland. Whatever the reason, people traveling the Oregon Trail had a goal in mind, to make the journey and not to die while doing it. The Homestead Act, signed into law by Abe Lincoln himself in 1862, was also a big motivator. The act said people could claim 160 acres of land if they promised to grow crops on it. Not a bad deal, especially if you consider the fact that it made it easier for single, widowed, and divorced women to claim land in their own names. You go, girl. But what was it really like? Well, let's set the hypothetical scene. It's the mid-19th century. Your current town on the East Coast is overcrowded, and you're sick of living like a sardine in a pretty unhygienic sardine can. Maybe your friend Jebediah won't stop talking your ear off about wolf pelts, and you start to think, hey, maybe this West thing is the best thing. And hey, a football stadium's worth of land in exchange for growing a few crops? <laughs> what could go wrong? Turns out, a lot can go wrong. Especially when you're traveling thousands of miles without modern medicine and infrastructure. And when we say go wrong, we mean death. Death, 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 and death. Everywhere you look, death. Whomever said nature was the best medicine clearly never tried to survive outside with just a flimsy wagon to protect them. If you died crossing the Oregon Trail, nine times out of ten, it was from some sort of disease and serious illness. Smallpox, flu, measles, mumps, and tuberculosis could jump through an entire wagon camp faster than you can say yee-haw, and those pioneers could do little to prevent it. One of the most dreaded illnesses you could catch was cholera. It could affect someone at breakfast, and then by the time lunch rolled around, they'd be dead. Cholera. That'll ruin an appetite. If you've ever moved anywhere, you know the nightmare that goes along with deciding what to pack up, donate, or toss. Now, multiply that nightmare by a thousand. If you were an Oregon Trail pioneer, you'd have to pack insanely light. Typical wagons could carry 2,000 pounds, which sounds like a lot, but when you consider the fact that 1,800 pounds of that was food, you'd have to reckon with the sad reality of ditching your favorite beat-up lazy boy, or whatever else the 1,800s equivalent was at the time. Oregon Trail wagons were packed mostly with food and essentials, and let's just say the grocery list was not exactly a gourmet situation. Pioneers brought along flour, crackers, bacon, sugar, coffee, tea, and beans. They packed light when it came to kitchen supplies, clothes, and other items, and they did it all without the help of organizing guru Marie Kondo. Impressive. Along the way, any animals they brought would likely start getting tired or hurt, and sometimes they'd become food as a result. If you were traveling along the Oregon Trail and something broke, you couldn't store it until you got the chance to repair it. Lightening the load was a constant issue, so pioneers would ditch their broken supplies on the side of the road to save weight. Litter bugs. And hey, if you don't like the idea of seeing trash on the road, you're definitely not gonna like this. <laughs> Human bodies and trash were treated the same among the Oregon Trail pioneers, which is to say, they were ditched hastily on the side of the road. When you factor in a much lower life expectancy and lack of medical care, death was just a fact of life when it came to crossing the Oregon Trail. Everywhere they looked, darkness waited. People died from disease, crossing rivers, horses bucking riders, and or getting crushed by a wagon wheel. Gun deaths were also pretty common on the trail. Other causes of trail riders' demise included lightning storms, grass fires, hailstorms, snake bites, gunpowder explosions, suicide, and pioneer on pioneer violence. If you passed on to the great buffalo bullpen in the sky, the remaining pioneers would bury your body directly onto the trail so animals and wagons could roll right over. This would help ease the scent if any wolves were looking for a quick snack. Bodies became literal speed bumps on the road. Rest in peace became rest in peace on the trail. If you're hung up on the stereotypes that Native Americans posed a huge threat to the pioneers crossing the Oregon Trail, think again. As pioneers were passing through and settling on land, Native Americans were, more often than not, kind, friendly, and even traded with land-hungry pioneers for goods and food. In the mid-19th century, traveling across the country wasn't as easy as hopping on a Boeing 747 and chomping down on the pretzels for a few hours. Back then, the 2,170 miles from Missouri to Oregon and California would take between four and six months to complete. Talk about a long, boring road trip. Couldn't even listen to podcasts. Wealthier pioneers could avoid the bumpy road trip by springing for expensive passage on a ship, but that took a full year and it meant they'd miss all the wonders of the American plains. But still, some people opted for a year of seasickness. There was absolutely a right and a wrong time of year to travel the Oregon Trail. Like traveling to Arizona in the middle of July, there were just certain seasons which made the journey uninhabitable. Except instead of suffering a mighty sunburn by the hotel pool, the consequence for traveling the trail at the wrong time meant certain death. Pioneers left too early in the year, the oxen would starve to death because the grass along the route hadn't grown enough. Without oxen and cattle, pioneers were screwed. If they left too late in the year, travelers might get stuck in the brutally cold winter and have to deal with frostbite and freezing to death. And if pioneers got stranded, they couldn't exactly call an Uber to take them home. And even if Uber existed, the surcharges would have been way too high. 
Close your eyes and picture a pioneer traveling across the country in a wagon. Is it a boat-shaped Conestoga wagon with sweeping canopies and a huge cargo area? Good. Now erase that image from your head because it's wrong. Big, bulky wagons were poorly suited for functioning on the rugged terrain of the Oregon Trail. Instead, most pioneers opted for smaller wagons known as prairie schooners. Their smaller design made for a notoriously bumpy ride, which is why most people prefer to walk next to the wagon instead. Probably a good idea considering they didn't come with vomit bags. Keeping your mental health intact during a 2,000-mile walk across a bleak and deadly landscape accompanied by the same small group of friends and family was no easy task. And sadly for many people, it was straight-up impossible. One darkly tragic tale of the trail happened to a woman named Elizabeth Markham. While traveling with her family along the eerily named Snake River, she announced that she wasn't going any further. No amount of coaxing could get her to join the group, so her husband was forced to take the wagons and children and abandon her. Her husband did eventually send their son back to get her, but that maybe wasn't the best idea he'd ever had. Eventually, Elizabeth returned to the family and promptly informed them that she had killed her son by clubbing him to death. Yikes. Her husband raced back to retrieve the son and found him clinging to life. Upon their return, they found that Markham had set fire to one of their wagons. As time went on, the trend of packing up your belongings and heading out west caught on like wildfire. If you were an in-the-know early trendsetter of 1841, you'd leave in a group of 70 for the Oregon Trail. In 1843, however, things really exploded. A group of over 1,000 people left from the Midwest as the cross-country exhibition gained popularity. And in 1845, the number jumped up to 3,000, making it America's hottest new trend, right up there alongside bonnets in the Mexican-American War. The Oregon Trail pioneers may have left almost 200 years ago, but that doesn't mean they don't share the same bored habits that we do today. They killed time by doing one of America's favorite pastimes, doodling. A lot of pioneers painted messages on their wagons, and many took part in the tradition of carving their names, the date, and their hometowns on some of the gigantic stones they passed. They basically treated our natural resources like a high school bathroom wall. One rock pioneers especially loved was Independence Rock in Wyoming, a massive 128-foot tall slab. It was nicknamed the Register of the Desert, and over the years, thousands of travelers left their marks on the gigantic rock. Graffiti taggers would be proud. To say daily life on the Oregon Trail was difficult is a vast understatement. Life on the Oregon Trail was brutal, and for many, many people, it ended in death. If you could survive walking 2,000 miles in their disease-battling, resource-scrounging shoes, then you'd probably make a pretty good road trip, buddy, today. How would you like to cross the Oregon Trail? Let us know in the comments.